10 through 18. And we'll get started tonight on getting up and getting down. This is number seven, getting up and getting down now, nowadays, number seven. So here's our text, Ephesians chapter six, verses 10 through 18. Put on the, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Amen. This is an, there is, and this is describing an invisible war that is going on right now in every heart. All of the fleshly lusts are the unseen enemy that is diabolically promoted by the demons of hell. Boldly, they make war with impunity, knowing every weak point of the believer. If a believer has a weakness in sexual desires, those demons exploit that weakness. If one has a weakness in power and control, the demons exploit that weakness as well. If one has a weakness in the desire of popularity and approval of others, the demons will exploit that weakness. If one has a weakness in the area of finances or money or the love of money, the demons of hell will exploit that weakness. You can go on and on and on with that list. I've noticed, and I'm sure that you have noticed in these days, the increase in despondency, despair, discouragement, and depression in these days of COVID-19 restrictions. How many of you have noticed what I'm saying? I've noticed it all around. Our text in verse 11 says that we ought to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And so what I'm preaching tonight is helping you and to help me to stand in these evil days because these are evil days. John Gill says this. He says, the devil is the grand enemy of Christ and his people. And I believe that. And he is a very, he's very powerful and he's very cunning. And he is so powerful and so cunning that it takes the entire army of God to with, armor of God to withstand him. So we cannot leave off one part of it we must have all the whole armor. It says, put on the whole armor of God. And so that very fact that we are told by the Holy Spirit to put on the whole armor of God indicates to me that we have a powerful, powerful enemy in Satan and his demons. So we are to wear that armor, though, and as we wear that armor, we are able to confound or confuse the schemes of the devil, we are to baffle his arts and we are to baffle his stratagems and we are more than conquerors than we uh, think we are. So many times we think that we are gullible and weak and can't do anything about it. But the Bible is not describing some kind of weak, mamby-pamby, weakling here. The Bible is describing a believer warrior who is strong. He's got the armor of God on. And with the armor of God, he's able to fight against this powerful enemy, the devil, and all his demons. Now, you think about that. You, as a believer, with the armor of God, have the ability to fight against the devil and all of his demons. Folks, that is a powerful soldier. I'm not talking about a powerful devil. I'm not talking about a powerful host of demons. I'm talking about a powerful believer who is able to withstand Satan and his devices. As mighty conquering soldiers, we can think, I can be like David who slew the Goliath. I can be like one of the great warriors in the Bible, Joshua, who won, won and fought many battles. We can think we can be like Paul of the New Testament, 
who fought many spiritual battles as well as physical battles. So you take all of those men, you, anybody in the Bible that was a great warrior, you think about them. You as a believer with the armor of God on are just as strong or stronger than those men because now we have the presence of the Holy Spirit whereas these Old Testament uh, believers didn't have that except on certain occasions. So here we are now as mighty soldiers. I want to present to you the mighty soldier. I don't want to present to you a weakling. I don't want to present to you some kind of nothing. I want you to get this thought in your mind. Believers with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who put on the whole armor of God are powerful, mighty warriors. I want you to get that thought in your heart. Now, as mighty warriors, we are now taking our seat before our commander-in-chief, or we can say, as the Bible says, the captain of the Lord of hosts. And let's imagine that we're in a war room. In other words, here is a room full of soldiers, and our Lord of hosts, the captain, is going to come out, and he's going to address the troops, especially these mighty warriors. And so here we are in the war room, seated with rapt attention, we are not there slouching back in our chair. There are no lounge chairs in this war room. There's no TVs in this war room. There's nothing to indicate ease whatsoever. It is every bit like you would think a military place would be. Straight chairs, chalkboard, blank walls, and here in just a minute is going to walk through the doors our commander-in-chief or our captain of the Lord of hosts, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are sitting there with our heads high, our back straight, our feet planted firmly on the ground in front of our chairs, awaiting breathlessly the entrance of our captain. He walks through the door, and everybody jumps to their feet and salutes. How many of you can see that scene? I tell you what, most churches are not like that. Most, you say, preacher, you're going to expose our laziness. Let me tell you this. Most believers are at ease in Zion. They are not soldiers on the edge of their chair. They are not soldiers saluting the captain. They're just sitting back and floating along. I'm not talking necessarily about you. I'm just talking about generalities now. I'm talking in general. So I don't want you to think I'm beating on you. I'm just talking about the church as a whole is at ease in Zion. Would you not say Amen. Amen. At ease in Zion. We have hung our harps on the willow trees and we are saying it's no use. I mean, the COVID has wiped us out and knocked our churches down to nothing. We can read all kinds of statistics on that. But not in this room. Here's the war room. Here's all these soldiers, mighty soldiers. I mean, one of the greatest crew that you could ever imagine is seated here. And then the captain walks in and they all jump up for the salute. And then he says, as you would probably think, at ease, men. And with a very authoritative air, he begins to describe the enemy that they are going to face. He is going to warn them. I want you to know, men, that this battle that we are facing now is a matter of life and death. This is serious business. And I want to show you some things that will help you to win the battle. Now, we've got the captain of the Lord of hosts. We've got the perfect military genius in front of us. We sit down in our chairs because he has told us to. We have lowered our arms from the salute. We are straight in the chairs that we're sitting in. And we are got our eyes pinpointed on him. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing to distract us. We're not playing with our gadgets. We're not writing any notes. We're not doing anything. We're sitting there and our eyes are riveted on our captain. Boy, would that be a change in a church service. Amen. Boy, that would be different, wouldn't it? But now here's those men. And the captain, as he looks at them as a captain, he still loves them. They are his men. They are his soldiers. He's dependent on them. And he says, I've got some things I want to tell you about the enemy. Now listen. Number one, our enemy is the devil. And he has tactics 
And I want to tell you about those tactics. I want to tell you his methods. The word wiles in our text comes from the word methodia. And it's where we get our word methods. It is a compound word consisting of the word meta, M-E-T-A, meaning accompanying or together with or proximity. And the word hoduo, and hoduo means to travel or journey. And so we get from this compound word of wiles, we get one who travels with us in our journey. But now remember, this is talking about Satan. And our captain is saying, I want to tell you about your enemy. He has tactics. He has wiles according to the word of God. Those wiles means that he is with you. Now I know Satan can't be omnipresent, but he and his demons, there's many demons. But he can be with you either in person or with demons. He says he's going to accompany you on your journey. I got news for every single one of you. You are soldiers. I'm a soldier. The devil and his demons have not left us. They are still around. Amen. And so the first thing you need to know is the wiles includes the proximity of the devil. He said, I want you to know every soldier as they sit there stiff in their seats, feet planted on the ground, eyes riveted on him. He said, I want to tell you something, soldier. Your enemy is right beside you all the time. Don't you ever forget that. And I want you to know as I drop back from my scene of the captain and his troop, I want to drop back from that scene to this group. And I want to say, I want you to know that don't you ever forget Satan and his demons are right beside you. You say, but preacher, I've got the Holy Spirit. Thank God we have the person of the Holy Spirit, the one who comes along beside. That, in fact, it's almost the same word, but it's not. But he is the one who comes along. So I've got not only the Holy Spirit, but I have also the accompanying demons or devil that go with it. Think about that. So the soldier that is sitting there, he knows because of his captain that he instinctively, because of the spiritual nature of this battle and this soldier and this captain, he knows intuitively that he has the Holy Spirit to help him. And that's something that no other person has. Only a believer has that. So the devil and his demon goes after everybody, but the believer has the Holy Spirit. But now he listens to the commander. He said, I've got the Holy Spirit. I know that instinctively, spiritually instinctively. I've got the Holy Spirit, but I'm going to listen to my captain. My captain's got something to say to me. So the captain says, I want you to know that like a spy... The devil or his demons are watching every move you make. Like a spy, the devil or his demons are watching every move you make. Albert Barnes says this about the wiles. That which is well laid, art, skill, cunning, it occurs in the New Testament only in Ephesians 4.14 and in this place, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, two times the word wiles occurs there. Meaning cunning devices, arts, attempts to delude and destroy us. I want you to know something. This enemy that is beside you, that accompanies you on your journey, the captain may say this. He's got one goal, to destroy you. However he can do that, he wants to destroy the believer. How many of you know that's the truth? Do you know that the devil and his demons want you destroyed? Whatever it takes, health problems, physical problems, mental problems, it doesn't matter, social problems, financial problems, he wants the believer destroyed. The wiles of the devil are the various arts and stratagems which he employs to drag souls down to perdition. We can more easily, this is Barnes, we can more easily encounter open force than we can cunning. And we need the weapons of Christian armor to meet the attempts to draw us into a snare as much as to meet open force. The idea here is, according to Barnes and according to the word of God, simply put, I've called it the invisible war, but the simple truth is this. 
Satan is not coming at you or his demons coming at you with open force. He's not coming at you with his fist balled up and threatening to knock your block off. He may use somebody to do that, but let me tell you something. He's not in that business. It's not open force. No openness, no contact like that. It's cunning behind the scenes, deceit. You watch him. It's the wiles. He is using and employing his cunning power rather than his physical power. He betrays people and wants them to betray the Lord. He wants to vanquish by his cunningness and not force. And so since he's using these cunning devices, are they secret devices, the believer must have something to combat him with. How do we combat the unseen enemy? How do we combat something that doesn't confront us physically? You must and I must have the whole armor of God. The Bible says in this passage of Scripture, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not an outward battle. It's an inward, out kind of inward cunningness and deceitful thing. It's covert, totally behind the scenes. And it is imperative that we understand the wiles of the devil. Our captain is saying to us as we sit in our seats, upright, riveted on him, he's saying, you must understand the wiles of the devil. They're covert. They are not open. And therefore, you must have armor on that withstands his cunning, covert, hidden tactics. It is imperative that we get that in our mind before we go to battle. Soldiers, before we walk out this door and go to battle, you must know the wiles of the devil are cunning, covert, behind the scenes. They're not open. So the captain of our Lord of hosts, the Lord Jesus Christ, points to the blackboard behind him. And as he points to the blackboard, he's already written. An unseen hand has written about the wiles of the devil and about the cunningness and the covertness and the deceit. He's already written that, but then as that unseen hand, so to speak, our finger writes on the blackboard, just as quickly as he wrote that and pointed it out to those soldiers, then another seeming like invisible hand just washes that blackboard clean and a finger appears and begins to write again. And here's what he says to his men. As the finger begins to write, this is what it says on the blackboard, just a finger. The 16 deadly deeds of the devil. The 16 deadly deeds of the devil. Now I'll not get to 16 of those, but I'll tell you there are a few of them. I'll give you at least three. Number one, the finger is writing on the blackboard. The soldiers are sitting there in their seat, riveted, straight attention, looking forward, taking every word in. And the captain says, number one, the devil, and that finger begins to write wants to defeat you or to destroy you by, and the finger writes, number one, disappointment. D-I-S-A-P-P-O-I-N-T-M-E-N-T. -E the finger writes in big, bold letters, disappointment. The soldiers are sitting there. They're used to all sorts of types of fighting, especially physical fighting. They thought maybe they would get instructions with some kind of rifle or some kind of machine gun. But instead, they're getting told by their captain, the devil has wiles. And these wiles are very cunning, very covert, very secret. And you need to know that. Before you go to battle, you need to know it. And the first thing you need to know about his cunning, overt, covert devices is this, disappointment. That's behind the scenes. That's underneath the surface. That's something that nobody comes along and smacks you and says, now are you disappointed? No, it's not a forceful thing. It's disappointment in the heart of the soldier. So every one of those soldiers sitting there and saying, he's telling me, my captain's telling me that my heart can get disappointed. 
Disappointment in the heart of the believer, warrior, is the goal of the devil. If he can get you disappointed, he can destroy you. As is our, the normal manner of our captain, he refers to the battle manual of the soldiers. I don't know if you know it or not, but we have a battle manual. Do you know that you have a battle manual? This is your battle manual. And the Lord Jesus Christ as captain refers to that battle manual. And he says, I want to tell you something that will help you with disappointment. The devil is going to try to get you disappointed. Every soldier in here, I want you to know the devil is going to try to get you disappointed. And says, I want you to get this out of your manual. This is section Romans in your manual. And it's also article 828. I want you to get this down. And that invisible hand with the finger begins to write. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. And he says, soldiers, repeat that for me. And all those soldiers in strict obedience. And in uh, alert attention. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God. And to them who are the called according to his purpose. In unison. He said, now I want to tell you what that will do. That is in your manual. Now you better get it and you better memorize it. I want every single soldier to memorize that. There are going to be things that happen to you in this battle that you cannot explain. There are going to be things that are going to happen to you that are very, very disappointing. He says, but I want you to know something. All the things that happen to you are not for your disappointment. Now, I want to say that real clear. The captain of the Lord of hosts is saying that to these soldiers. I'm saying it to you. The things that happen to each of you and me, and things are happening, those things are not for your disappointment. Amen. You see, if we're not careful, we will get the idea that something's wrong with God, that God has forgotten us, that God doesn't know what he's doing, and that we will get disappointed with the things that happen to us. Back to the manual. Soldiers, back to your manual. Things are going to happen to you that you do not understand, but they're not for your disappointment. I'm not trying to disappoint you. I'm the captain. I'm not trying to disappoint you. And we know that all things, all things, Work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. Say, you are my called soldiers. And I want you to know something. All the things are not to disappoint you. None of them. He says, here's the reason why. I am working all the things out in your life that you may think are disappointing that the devil wants you to be disappointed in, but I'm working those things out in your life for your good. Do you understand that, soldiers? I'm working all of these things out for your good. They're not disappointments. They're for your good. Now, can I get an amen right there? All the things that are happening to you are not disappointments. They're for your good. Amen. 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 You say, what about it, preacher? I'm physically sick. Or I got this or I got that. Or I got this problem. I got that problem. Wait just a minute. All the things that are happening to you are for your good. Is that clear? Amen. So our captain is trying to make it very clear to us. You must not let Satan get the advantage. The captain continues. You, when you get disappointed in the all things that happen in your life, when you get disappointed, you are letting Satan deceive you with that cunning wile, that covertness, that inner hidden thing you're letting Satan get the advantage. According to the manual you have, the Bible, of course, all low places are given divinely to you to help you. Do not let the low places disappoint you. Do not let the devil cause disappointment to enter your hearts. The Lord then, or the captain then, refers to a lieutenant who is well known in the history of the soldiers. He says, one of our lieutenants said this, 
So remember it. All disappointments are God's appointments. How many of you can remember? That's not in the Bible, but that's clearly a principle in the Bible in Romans 8, 28. One of the lieutenants, and I don't know the name of the preacher that said it or the evangelist that said it, but some missionary evangelist or somebody said it. So the Lord is referring to a lieutenant or a soldier that has passed on. And he says, one of our lieutenants, men, has given us this saying. Don't you forget it. All of your disappointments are God's appointments. How many of you can remember that? All of those disappointing things, every bit of them, are God's appointments. That is the way, soldier, you must view all things. And we know that all things, all things, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. And then the captain begins to turn back toward the blackboard behind him and that invisible hand washes the blackboard clean again and a finger begins to write number two the captain says to those alert troops sitting in front of him straight in their chairs back straight feet planted on the ground eyes riveted right toward him their ears are so tuned in it's amazing they are listening to it for every little nuance of sound coming from his voice. Man, I wish that's the way it was when we heard the word of God. And as they listened, he says, number two. I want to give you another one. <clears throat> I got to get down here to it. Here it is. And the hand begins to write. D I S C O U R A G E M E N T Discouragement. The captain says to us soldiers, the wiles of the devil are cunning. They're behind the scenes, they're covert. Number one, he wants you disappointed. And if he can get you disappointed, the next step in disappointment is discouragement. If I can get that soldier disappointed, the next step is discouraged. <clears throat> can I say this? I'm stepping aside from the captain right now, and I'm going to say this. All discouragement is of the devil. All discouragement is of the devil. <clears throat> Here is a story from the life of Martin Luther. Most of us think of Martin Luther as a great spiritual hero, and he was. But he had great times of discouragement. Most people don't realize that. He would get highly discouraged. For days, Martin Luther had been in the valley of discouragement. By the way, discouragement can take you into days and days and days of just being down. So after days and days of discouragement, Martin Luther another one of the Lord's lieutenants. As he was discouraged, he was thinking, the Pope is trying to kill me. His friends that he had known, other priests, other family members, other people, had shied away from him, shunned him because of what he was standing for. So here he is, the Pope is trying to kill me. My friends are leaving me. My family, some of my family even don't have anything to do with me. And he's deeply, I mean heart-wrenching, discouraged. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been to that deep, dark place of discouragement? Martin Luther was. Suddenly, he noticed something 
in his state of discouragement, he looked up, and here comes his wife down the stairway. And she comes down from the second floor, down to the first floor where Martin is, and she's dressed in black like she's in mourning, like she's going to a funeral. And, she's, and Martin says to his wife in this dark garb, Woman, where are you going? Just as a side note, I don't know where the old timers got into this habit of saying woman for their wives. I've never called my wife a woman. I always call her Gail. But years ago, that was not a bad way of referring to your wife. But I don't think it's very appropriate nowadays. I do not ad advocate calling your wife woman. But it was accepted in years gone by. So he says, woman, where are you going? And she said, to a funeral husband. Now, back then, they would call their husband husbands. I don't think we do that now. We'd call them by their first name. We wouldn't say husband, but she did. She said, I'm going to a funeral husband. And he says to her, oh, but who died? And she looked him square in the eye. I can just see her now. And she said, God did. With that, the great reformer exploded in righteous indignation. It wasn't enough that the Pope was trying to kill him. It wasn't enough that all the people and friends that he had and, and priest friends and all the other people, they were leaving him and shunning him. It wasn't enough, but his own wife was uttering words of blasphemy in his own household. And he exploded back to his wife, woman, who told you such a thing? And looking him straight in the eye again, she said, you did. Martin, by the way you've been acting the past few weeks, I was sure that somehow you found out that God was dead. Do you know what Martin Luther did? When his wife confronted him and said, you have shown me that God is dead by the way you've been acting. Martin Luther fell on his knees. I hadn't heard this. I hadn't heard of anybody in a hundred years falling on their knees. Surely not a man before his wife. Martin Luther fell on his knees before his wife and begged her forgiveness and begged the forgiveness of God. You see, to be discouraged is to forget God and act like God is dead. So our captain picks up the manual again. Now really, he doesn't have to pick it up. He knows it verbatim from cover to cover. And he says, I want you soldiers that are sitting there so alertly paying attention now. I want you to get this out of your manual. It's in section 1 Samuel, article 30 and 6. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. The captain continues, one of the greatest military leaders that has ever lived is my servant David. And when David got in a situation, I've already preached on this situation before, so I'll not preach that situation again, but he said when David got in a situation when everything was gone, his wife was gone, his children were gone, his cattle was gone, the city was burned with fire, zigzag, and all his mighty men and their wives and all their cattle and all their children and all their grandchildren everybody was gone and they were going to stone David he said I want you to remember soldier what David did he did not forget God he encouraged himself and here's the phrase that must make all the difference in the world in the Lord he encouraged himself in the Lord He said, now that David that encouraged himself in the Lord in the face of insurmountable odds, 
who could have been highly discouraged, greatly discouraged, fought against Satan with one thing. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Now, folks, that's exactly what this passage of Scripture is talking about, putting on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's exactly what it's talking about, encouraging yourself. So, number one, the devil wants to get you disappointed. And so the finger has written disappointment up there and erased it. He's written about the wiles of the devil, the covert activity of the devil, and erased it. And he's written disappointment, discouragement. And now he says, as he turns back to the blackboard, the hand has wiped it clean again. You remember, how many of you remember when the king of Babylon saw the handwriting on the wall? Did that finger come out and write on the wall, many, many, tekel you farson? It did, didn't it? This day thy kingdom is numbered and so on. In other words, it's going to, he's going to lose his kingdom that day, the king of Babylon. Hey, listen. Those Chaldeans were wise, wise, wise people. They thought they had all the knowledge in the world. But they were agents of Satan. And they were partying it up like everything was going to be fine. And as they partied it up, that finger began to write on the wall. So listen, that divine finger that was in the book of Daniel now is writing on the wall. I believe it's the Holy Spirit of God. He says, number three. Soldiers, I want you to get this. If the devil can get you disappointed, he wants to next get you discouraged. And he has one purpose in mind, to destroy you. Number three. And the finger begins to write. D E S P A I R. Despair. The soldiers are sitting there in their seats, duly noting that their enemy is no ordinary enemy. He is entirely invisible, but he is very, very real. They know that this despair is a tactic or wile of the devil. Their captain has told them so. They go in a progression. Disappointment, discouragement, and third, it's a progression, despair. They go together is what I'm trying to say. One leads to the other. Disappointment, discouragement, and finally despair. Again, the captain says to the believer warrior, as they are seated there, alertly listening, never moving an eyebrow or an eyelash, hardly swallowing at all. If they do swallow, they barely let it be seen. Stiff and straight, they look at their captain, eyes riveted on him, ears attentively listening to him. He says, I want you to know something. If you allow Satan to get you disappointed, if you allow Satan to get you discouraged, you will end up in despair. And you will not be a soldier at all. You cannot be a soldier as you follow down that path. When you get to despair, you will be ineffective as a soldier. I need soldiers. I need believer warriors who can fight this invisible war. I want to refer to the manual again, the captain says. This is in the section called 2 Corinthians and Article 4, 8 through 10. And it is about another lieutenant, and his name is the Apostle Paul. And here's what the Apostle Paul wrote. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. The Apostle Paul had learned to be a soldier. He says, I'm not in despair. I'm not going to give in to it. And then he continues. Persecuted, but not forsaken. 
cast down, but not destroyed. There's that word destroy, the very goal of Satan for every soldier believer. And then he says, always bearing about in my body, in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of also of Jesus might be made manifest in my body. The captain then looks at his soldiers and says, I want to call your attention to the knots in that passage from the manual. The N-O-T-S, the knots. My daddy used to call this, in fact, he preached a message called the knots in the devil's tail. And I want to call your attention to the knots in that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Not distressed, not in despair, not forsaken, not destroyed. Those are the great knots for the believer warrior. I hope you can remember them. Every soldier needs this, not distressed, not in despair, not forsaken, not destroyed. Oh, I wish we could get that. Remember the captain said, trouble will not cause you distress. That's what that manual is talking about. Trouble will not cause you distress. I hope and pray that we can get that. Trouble will not cause you distress. The believer warrior, knows and should know this. Trouble will not cause you distress. Remember that. Trouble will not. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. There's going to be a day right down the road where you're going to need exactly what I'm saying, and I hope it will rebound in your heart over and over again. Trouble will not cause you distress. Amen. And then the captain says to his soldiers again, I want you to know something else. Perplex perplexities. Perplexities will not cause you despair. And there's a difference between troubles and perplexities. Perplexities are all complicated. Perplexities will not cause you despair. You cannot get into that mode of despair. Perplexities won't do it. If you have on the whole armor of God, soldier, you will not have despair. <clears throat> and then the captain says, persecutions will not cause you to be forsaken. And then he says, being cast down will not cause you to be destroyed. Those are powerful statements by our captain. Oh, I wish we could get that down in the manual. Don't forget it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Again, our captain says, I want to refer to another lieutenant, the same one I referred to earlier, Martin Luther. I want to refer to that Martin Luther again. Martin Luther was often very capable of graphic descriptions of the devil. And not only graphic descriptions of the devil, but also graphic descriptions of his activities. Asked one time how he overcame the devil, he replied, Well, when he comes knocking upon the door of my heart and asks, Who lives here? The dear Lord Jesus goes to the door. Remember, Martin Luther didn't go to the door. The Lord Jesus went to the door. He said, When the devil comes to my heart and says, Who lives here? He said, the Lord Jesus goes to the door. And the Lord Jesus says to the devil, Martin Luther used to live here, but now I live here. How you like that? Folks, I want to tell you something. Put your name there. Let's say it's Dan Waters. Dan Waters, the Lord says to the devil, Dan Waters used to live in his heart, but he doesn't any longer. The Lord says, I live here. Now, what do you think that Satan's going to do? Here Satan standing before my heart's door and the Lord Jesus comes up to him and says, Dan Waters don't live here no more. I do. I think Satan is going to turn tail and run, don't you? Yeah, you think about it. So Martin Luther says, the devil seeing the nail print in his hands and his pierced side takes flight immediately. It is surely good for every home and for every heart to have Jesus as a permanent resident. Again, the captain turns to look at the blackboard and the invisible hand erases everything. The board is clean. And the captain says, soldiers, I want you to remember these three things. And the hand writes, number one, 
disappointment. Number two, discouragement. Number three, despair. Be ready, soldiers. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And in your manual, it says this. In section 2 Timothy, article 2 and 15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Learn your manual. And don't forget the wiles of the devil. And he says, Dismissed. Captain walks out of the room. Soldiers stand and file out in a somber mode. Why? They've got a battle to fight. A battle to fight. Can I remind you, yes, there's place and room for rejoicing. And the Bible tells us how, how much we ought to rejoice and praise the Lord. But I'm going to tell you something. Some people just want the rejoicing, and they don't want no battle. I got news for you. There's no rejoicing unless there's a battle. There's no victory parade 